want to officially say good morning and afternoon to everyone. We're so excited to welcome you to this landmark session. We have about a thousand and more finance and accounting professionals joining us today. And my name is Nicole Schmeider. I'm the Senior Marketing Specialist here at DocuWare, and I'll be moderating today's session. I'm thrilled to introduce our two finance experts here on the line with us today, Christian Vatig and Nicholas Boucher. Christian is an FP&A expert and thought leader with over a decade of leadership experience at Procter & Gamble, Unilever, and more. He teaches FP&A skills to corporate finance teams and has over 100,000 LinkedIn followers and over 30,000 newsletter subscribers. Nicholas is a prominent thought leader in finance areas such as AI, FPA, and controlling, and shares daily insights with over 1 million followers. He founded the AI Finance Club and has trained over 3,000 professionals on ChatGPT for finance. We also have my colleague Nick Ivins, UK Marketing Manager at DocuWare on the line, and he'll be joining us again at the Q&A session at the end. Our goal today is to ensure that you not only gain new perspectives, but also feel empowered to tackle the challenges and embrace the opportunities that lie ahead in this fast-paced world of finance. All right, everyone, let's officially get started. So Christian and Nicholas, you often hear that the way finance teams work is rapidly changing. The term future of finance is often used to describe a future state where teams work differently. Can you explain what that means and what finance leaders need to be aware of? Yeah, absolutely. So finance teams today spend a lot of time on formatting data, reconciliation between different systems, dealing with exceptions, removing duplicates and copy pasting, right? So <clears throat> for example, let's say you want to estimate the cost of your qualified leads. You download the lead data from your CRM system, and then you want to merge it with cost data from your accounting system. That can be tricky if the data isn't formatted exactly the same way in both systems and take a lot of time to manually fix in Excel. Or you may have inconsistencies with naming conventions because multiple people did the data entry. The data cleaning for this kind of work can take a long time. Then there's creating standard reports. Let's say you have a report that looks at aging of purchase orders, right? A, a common example. To create that report, you need to match invoices with the corresponding purchase orders. If some of these invoices are on paper and some are digital, that process can take a lot of time without the right tools. Then there is variance analysis commentary, you know, one of the core tasks of uh, finance teams. And even if you have your data flows and reports under control, it doesn't add much value to write the same comments about differences between actual and forecast over and over again. So what does the future of finance look like? You have all those tasks that I mentioned here automated. And once you get there, you save hours every day. And you, know, you may be wondering, what can finance teams do with those extra hours? So there you can run deeper analysis to start with, right? So instead of just saying, here's what happened last month, you can say why it happened and what the company should do because of it. A lot of finance teams share what happened and why it happened, but they skip the last, and I would argue most important step of the so what. What does that variance mean in terms of next steps? Let me give you a concrete example so you know what I'm talking about. Let's say you compare actuals to forecasts and you discover that professional fees are unfavorable by $250,000. That's the what. Then you may take it a step further and say, the increase in professional fees is primarily driven by Deloitte. That's a professional auditing firm. Many finance teams stop here, but that alone doesn't add a lot of value yet. You need the so what. So consider this, the cost increase is due to more billable hours, but rather, uh, rather than uh, Deloitte increasing the price. So we should compare the new price to other big four audit firms and consider a tender. Now you have a real action, a real next step from your variance analysis. And you can also spend more time on business partnering. It's going out there, building your relationships and establishing yourself as strategic advisors to the business. 
The only way to get there is to build trust because cross-functional partners will only share rich, you know, deep information with you if they trust that it won't be used to immediately cancel their favorite new project. And building that trust takes time. Effective finance teams also challenge assumptions, and the best way to challenge assumptions is by doing it based on data and analysis. So rather than saying to your head of sales, hey, I think your sales projections for the next quarter look a bit low, you can come to the discussion prepared with your own sales forecast model based on concrete business drivers. Driver-based planning is the, is the key word here. And then lastly, finance teams will be able to connect strategies with tactics and action plans and know how to measure the success of those strategies. In other words, finance teams need to be able to connect operational metrics with financials. So for example, you need to be able to answer questions like, what's the value of a website visit? And how does that compare to the value of a free trial? Or what may be the negative revenue impact when the consumer hotline receives 30% more calls that complain about product quality? If finance teams can answer these kinds of questions, they will be much more prepared to create better forecasts and help leaders make better decisions. That's interesting, Christian, because I have a good example on how finance is changing. And I actually saw what is the future of finance uh, two months ago when I got the chance to talk with the team of OpenAI. And just for uh, everybody who doesn't know still yet OpenAI, they are the one doing uh, ChatGPT. And they grew their business from $20 million revenue in 2022 to over $1 billion in 23 annualized revenue. So I, I think like, I don't know how many percentage it is, but you can imagine how hard they have to work in finance to cope with uh, this increase. And for me, like talking with them was really like looking in the future of finance because everything you mentioned at the left that you crossed is actually what they don't do. They automated all of this. So they have more time to spend really as a business partner and to uh, to deliver the analysis to help also the business change. And for everybody who is listening to us today, this team, imagine like, yeah, they are like 15, 20, and they recruit a lot of people, but they don't have time to cope with growth. So instead of hiring more people, they just get better at their work. They leave everything that is low value to the robots and they focus on high value activities. And for everybody who is here still wondering how they can do that, we are happy today to show, share with you how to do it and to also inspire you on that because this is really possible and this is where all of us in finance need to go. All right, that sounds great. So what do finance teams need to do to get to this future state? Yeah, so number one is process automation. Effective finance leaders constantly monitor what they do, right? And think about, okay, how can I save some time? How can I optimize them? For example, you may find that the process you use for verifications and approvals takes too much time, right? That's a common, common issue. After some digging, you may realize that delays come from missed and lost emails because executives send the approval emails to the wrong person, or they bury the approval in a long text that gets missed. Approvals can easily manage, be managed by uh, software, by the way, so you don't need to use email at all. Or they look at the process for having a two-way match of purchase orders and invoices, and realize that they missed several early payment discounts, or even got charged uh, late fees, because they took too long with digitizing their paper invoices. Now, the key for process automation is to have efficiency improvement targets. If your boss doesn't give you those targets, then you have to set them for yourself. What I mean with efficiency improvement targets is you say, every month you commit to save X number of hours by automating recurring processes or eliminating wasteful activities. And once you have these targets in place, it will be much easier to prioritize time at the end of each cycle to look back 
and see what can be improved. And as a result, you get this compounding effect and you move a bit closer to the future of finance every month. Then the next step on the journey is self-serve reporting. I also call it the holy grail of reporting. The ultimate goal finance teams have when it comes to preparing standard reports. To illustrate what I mean with self-serve reporting, here's the opposite of it. Let's say you finally finished the management reporting deck for the last quarter with one day to go until the big review meeting is scheduled. You send a presentation to the CEO and think, ha, finally, I'm done with this. But 20 minutes later, you get an email with requests for 10 additional slides, each showing a different way to show the business, you know, by country, by region, by customer group, and so on. And since you can't, since you have to do this manually, that means another five hours of work. So that's what we don't want. Self-service reporting, on the, uh, on the other hand, looks like this. You send your management reporting deck and the CEO thinks, huh, I wish I knew what the slide looks like by country. Ah, I remember I have access to this new cloud-based software we, we recently bought. Let's see. Ah, yeah, I can simply click here and here and have the view I need. I can even drill down. So that's what self-serve reporting looks like. Leaders can create the cuts and views of the business as they please without having to ask finance to create slides for it. And a tip for everybody on this, even if you don't have yet the highest technology, don't wait that all of the Power BI reports are there. Don't wait that um, a team comes and change all of your reports. It can just start by implementing some um, slicers in Excel. It can just start with going to your business partners, asking them what they want to see, and maybe just explaining them like how with just one or two clicks, they can see everything they need, and you don't have to duplicate reports. You don't have to send 20 uh, different emails because you have 20 uh, different departments. You don't have to make all of your team uh, just focused on sending emails when actually just taking their phone and asking what the people in front of them really need is going to help you. And that's also self-service reporting is not finance service, is how your business partner is going to use your report to take a decision. So always don't wait to talk to the business partner to make your report. Like just make the first draft, even if it's not pretty, sit down next to them and hear their feedback. Do they really need all of the information you have? Do they um, need something else? Look at how they are using it and you'll be much faster and produce much more value by doing, the, doing it with them than trying to stay behind your computer just within finance, trying to deliver the best report that at the end nobody is going to use. So even though today we talk about technology, everybody here, the 1,225 people, you are actually the ones that are going to either make the technology work for you or against you. And the technology is there, like it's not uh, something we can deny anymore, everything is possible, but you are the enabler. And if you are here today to listen to us, it means you are already in the top 1% that understood how important it is. And now just make it with your business, but not only for finance. All right, great. And so what about planning and collaboration? Do these tasks also need to change to realize the future of finance? Yeah, so actually let me tell you a story to give you a concrete example of how I used advanced tools and what some obstacles were that I had to overcome. And I, I hope that you know some of you who are also working on implementing advanced planning and collaboration tools can maybe learn something from the struggles that I had. So I worked at a large consumer goods company as the leader of an FP&A team that partnered with marketing. When I got promoted to lead that team and got up to speed in the processes, I was surprised to say the least. The team was managing the forecast for the entire marketing budget by consolidating 
12 Excel files with more than 10 sheets each. That's over 100, 100 Excel sheets. And that's to manage a, a budget of just over $1 billion. The thing is that managing a forecast with that many Excel files means you have to waste a lot of time on crunching the numbers, doing quality control. That's the time spent that could be used for higher value fp a activities, like I mentioned, business partnering, analysis, and so on. So I immediately realized that it would need to be one of my major goals to change this and get a new system. I went to the director in charge of IT budgets, and she immediately said that all the funds are already earmarked for the year for other things. There is no money to implement a new tool. If I wanted to purchase a new software, I had to ask the CFO directly to authorize additional funding. So I prepared a presentation and went to the CFO with a comprehensive deck and it highlighted how much time the team could save if we implemented the new software. And I did my best, I put out my best foot, I gave the presentation and it didn't excite him. I got a flat no. So back to the drawing board, I wasn't going to give up. So I talked to other finance leaders to figure out what the CFO actually cares about. And what I heard again and again is that he cares about financial controls, you know, that the numbers are right. Perfect, I thought. The new software would allow us to avoid complex Excel formulas that could break. It would help us ensure version control, meaning that we don't accidentally use an outdated spreadsheet. And I got another meeting with the CFO and pitched that. And to my, to my surprise, this time he approved the budget right away. So we set out, we got a vendor, we put a project team together, and we started with the implementation and training the marketing team who would use the tool to put their forecasts and their budget estimates directly into this cloud-based tool. Everything seemed to work out fine. And a few months later, we started to train our first end users in the marketing team a senior brand manager with more than 10 years experience at the company. To my surprise, she wasn't a fan of the new software at all, despite all the advantages I had listed for her. And I knew that if I can't even convince her to embrace the tool, the rest of the team who isn't as well-trained or as experienced would certainly not accept it. And I also thought that they would probably follow you know, her as an established leader. And after a lot of deliberation, I decided to invite her to join the project team to discuss changes and improvements to how we're implementing the software directly with the vendor. That changed everything. Having a say in how we would be using the tool completely changed her attitude. She ended up being one of our strongest supporters and helped me make sure that the rest of the marketing team gave the tool a chance as well. And with that, you know, it was a big success. People provided their budget inputs directly to the cloud. We could see the consolidated view moments later at the press of a button. You know, so it saved the finance team a lot of time and it improved controls. And so the takeaways here for what I learned from this is when you ask for funding for um, a productivity improvement for a new software, understand first what the decision makers actually really care about, you know, and make sure to focus your presentation on that. And then when you struggle with adoption, look at who are your biggest detractors and see if you can empower them. See if you can give them a seat at the decision-making table. That made a huge difference for me. Maybe I will just add on this, uh, having worked for a big company, like especially a production company where planning is really important, like I will emphasize what Christian says, there is collaboration inside, not only planning. And actually the budget is not only for finance, budget is also to help a company structure itself. Without a budget, HR, for example, they will not plan for next year the recruitment uh, because you need to have the process of sitting down with all of the head of departments to see what they need, who is leaving, what are the the transition phases for some of the employees. And so you really need to plan in your tools is where you are going to use it. So are you going to do a headcount planning? Are you going to do like a sales planning? Are you going to do also a production planning? And based on this, 
either you will have the departments with or not with uh, with it and it will be a more or less complex tool to implement and big companies use something like anaplan for example but anaplan you need a team of consultants to implement it smaller companies will use more web-based slash with excel like data rails where there are already templates inside and you can uh, use it but it will not adapt to all of your processes for a production company so use look at your own case and see if you need to implement all of the departments and then you might need a bigger project or look if you want to start small and start with uh, tools that have already templates and that you can uh, implement really quickly Great. So everyone talks about how AI will drastically change how people work. How does that impact the finance function? Yeah. So actually, let me start before. Let me start with clarifying a few terms. So let me start with machine learning. It's sometimes confused with AI, but machine learning is actually a subset of AI. And there's a lot of hype around generative AI tools right now. You know, like ChatGPT, etc. And we'll talk about those in depth in a minute. But machine learning is actually much older. It's been around for, for a number of years now, and it, it's becoming fairly popular among finance teams because machine, machine learning algorithms can help you forecast complex data sets. You know, they work especially well when you have uh, fairly established historical data. Because the way machine learning works is essentially it looks for patterns in your historical data and then uses those patterns to project into the future so if you have good historical data high quality data and you're dealing with many factors that implement you know the sales or the costs you want to forecast machine learning can be a fantastic tool and it used to be that basically you needed to have a data science team to to build this and to understand it but now there are many solutions out there where you don't need to have any statistics know-how to start machine learning at your company. You basically buy a software and it, it, it does it for you. So that's something to consider. But then, of course, there's what everybody talks about. There is generative AI. And uh, with that, you know, I want to hand it over to Nicolas because Nicolas, as, as many of you no is a leading expert on generative AI for finance. So Nicholas, what's your take on generative AI? Yeah, so the arrival of generative AI is really what for all of us who are not data scientists, who are not, I will say, uh, also AI experts initially. Generative AI, it's the door that just opened to all of us AI. And why so? Because when ChatGPT arrived one year ago, there was a big change. And the big change was as from uh, November 2022, when you went and talked with your own words, you had AI replying to you. And it could reply to you because there is one technology called NLP, Natural Language Processing which is basically taking human words and translating to computer uh, bits, doing the, um, all of the work within the model and then replying back with human words. And thanks to that, now we can make, even without any uh, background in coding, without any machine learning or data science knowledge, we can use AI for our work. And I'm actually excited to know a bit more here. Uh, who is already using AI? Who is using ChatGPT? And if you can tell us a bit more in the chat. Yeah, go ahead. Um, you know, everyone type yes or no. Let us know. There's no right or wrong answer. We just want to get a feel for, you know, what is everyone, um, you know, how's everyone experiencing it so far? So, Nicholas, what is the best way to start using ChatGPT? So let me actually, I prepared for everybody here a small demo. So okay. I will me, just uh... take over the screen. Yep. Go ahead. Yeah. So um, let me. So there is actually a lot of 
and can you confirm? Yeah, you can see everything, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. So there is actually uh, the beginners, and it's not, I would say, an insult for everybody who is uh, looking today, but mo I heard that yesterday. Somebody said, oh, I was using ChatGPT the wrong way. I was using it by um, using the Google method. And using the Google method gives, for example, if I am going to uh, ask to, for help for a dunning letter, it will do, and let me show you, I will go directly into ChatGPT. So, up. Can you now see my screen again? Yep. Yeah. So let's imagine I want to write a Dunning letter. So if I do the Google method, I will go inside ChatGPT and I will say Dunning letter. And what do we see here, Nicole? Does it is it like a Dunning letter um, that is written for me or not? No. Just okay. like giving just informational content. So, exactly. So if I ask you to work on a Dunning letter, this will just like give you some general information, but it will not help you. And that's the problem. Everybody who is beginner will just think, okay, ChatGPT is nice, gives me good information, write quite fast, but it didn't help me make my work better. So what can you do instead? Instead, you can become part of the 10% of the users by using my method, the CSI method. And CSI, so if you watch TV, is a good team to help you solve uh, crimes. And the C is for context. Because you imagine that if I work with Nicole and I ask her to write on a Dunning letter, to work on it, I'm not going to uh, our chat and I'm not going to just say Dunning letter. I'm going to give her some context. And then after I'm going to be specific about what is my problem. So first I explain the context to ChatGPT, saying that I am an accountant, for example. And like this, I know that ChatGPT is going to reply to me in my world of accounting. And then I will say my problem is that I have an overdue. But if I, do, if I stop here, I again let ChatGPT a lot of possibilities on how it can help me. And if I'm not specific enough on my instruction, if I don't say what I want from ChatGPT, I will not get what I want. So now I need to give a clear instruction and I will say, can you draft a communication to my client? So let's see what it does when I use uh, this. So I'll just copy the text and go to um, here to ChatGPT. Let me just open the up. I just need to go to Google. Okay. So you still see everything, Nicole, right? Okay, so I will open a new chat box and it doesn't matter if for this example, if it's 3.5 or four. So now if I paste this prompt using CSI, what, what do I see, Nicole? Uh, an actual letter is being written. So now, basically, it really helped me with my work. Like even uh, if you write really fast, I'm not sure you can write that fast. And also for a lot of non-English speakers, this is really helpful to write for us. But again, a lot of people will say, oh, it's a generic letter. Maybe also it's too long. So if it's too long, I can just say, make it shorter. And then again, I have a nice email. But Nicole, imagine that this client is always late and never pays on time. Do you think they will move if I send that? 
You might maybe need it to sound a bit more urgent. Yeah. And so now I'm going to show you how you can really solve problems with ChatGPT because this might not move the needle. So mm -hmm. I will show you now the really ultimate framework, which is, let me share with you, is, um, oh. so now I'm going to show you how you can really be part of, um, of the one person of users, which is, you see everything, right? Again? Mm -hmm. Okay. So we have CSI that help us, but let's bring now a second team, which is FBI. And the F in FBI is for the format. I'm going to be more clear about what type of discussion of format of communication I will use. And I could say letter, but I can also say a telephone script because Maybe I just want to call my client. And the B is for blueprint. Blueprint is actually the strongest element of everything here, because this is where I'm going to specify what I want inside the output. And I know that words like legal actions will work really well to urge the, uh, the client. And then the I is for identity. I can also ask ChatGPT to act as an expert. And what is the best expert when I want to write letters? A lawyer. So now let's see how I can use this formula and together I will just copy and paste the prompt here. So just bear with me. Mm -hmm. I am about, yeah. So if now I add FBI, yes, I have it here. So now I go back and do another discussion. And now I use the CSI and FBI. And what do you see now, Nicole, in the tone and in the quality of the response? And let's go back to the beginning. Yeah, it seems to have more legal context to it. Exactly. And you see, like, if I am a client and I see that, I will probably act more than the mail that I used before. And you can, you can just ask again, like, um, add bullet points to show the legal actions and make it a bit shorter. Because maybe, again, it's too long and not hard, not easy to read. But with these bullet points, then I know that the client is going to read it. So now, for everybody here today, this is how you just became from being a beginner to a pro in just learning this framework, which is CSI plus FBI. Got it. Good to know. So um, one more question. Uh, we often hear that chat GPT perhaps isn't that good with calculations. Um, can we really not use it for financial analysis or how does that work? Really good questions. <laughs> Actually, generative AI is made to generate an answer, not to calculate an answer. And we know that a spreadsheet is really good and is made to calculate. So us in finance, we are really focused on accuracy. And if we have a model in front of us that will generate an answer based on a probability and not based on accuracy, then we might encounter some problems. Uh, maybe a small joke for this. Do you know uh, when you ask the computer how to make a baby in one month, do you know what the computer will say? Not sure. <laughs> so it will just tell you, well, just make nine women pregnant. Mm. Uh, no, <laughs> not possible. So um, that's the problem with computers that are going just to like not know all of the humans principle, not know all of the um, yeah the accuracy. But I have actually a method to use 
ChatGPT and AI for financial analysis. And this method is actually what uh, ChatGPT and OpenAI use. If the model is not good to calculate, actually, you should not let the model calculate. You should let the model tell you how to calculate and then calculate yourself or let something else calculate. And I will show you how. So um, let's make an example. And one of my favorite examples, because everybody can understand, is um, let me go back here to Excel. Yeah. So imagine this list of employees. And I don't recommend anybody to upload any confidential data on uh, OpenAI or Gemini if your company doesn't allow you. And most probably, your company doesn't allow you. But it's just for the example. Uh, and I will show you after how you can do without the confidential information problem. So imagine this file with employees and salaries. You can actually go into ChatGPT. And now I will show you first in the version four how you can do. But now I have a button to upload. And there I can upload the headcount file. So now ChatGPT will read it. And I will just say, can you help me do an analysis on this file for my board? And create some visualizations. And when I do that, ChatGPT will use something that is not making hallucination. It's going to use a program called Python. So big news for everybody, two big news actually. If you work in finance, the first bad news is you cannot avoid Python anymore. Python, you will need to learn it. But the good news is you don't need to know how to program it because ChatGPT is now there to help you to program it. So thanks to this, ChatGPT knows exactly what is inside the file and will tell you, oh, I see that the file has all of these columns. And with this, I can generate all of this analysis. And then it asks me if I want that. And I can say, yes, go ahead. And so when it does this, we, again, instead of letting ChatGPT calculate, ChatGPT will program Python to do the calculations. And we can audit what is happening inside the code. And we can see. So here, for example, I can see um, do the distribution of salary by department. And you can see what is happening here. It will just do the aesthetics, calculate the average of salary, and create a graph. And let's see what is creating. So now we see average salary by department. And this is done by Python. And I can even ask, can you show me um, more details with outliers and average and range by department? So something quite hard to do. And again, because Python is quite elaborated it will be able to do all of this calculation using average, using uh, first the calculation, using then uh, graphs. And I have something, a graph. Let me make it a bit smaller for everybody. I have a graph, which is actually the best graph you can think of to show the salary distribution in a company. You have everything there. You have outliers, you have average salary, you can see the range in maintenance, you can see that production have low salary. And this is something that you could not have thought about doing it just by yourself without help from AI, unless you are a data science person with a lot of knowledge. So um, 
Nicole, I think we have a lot of questions, uh, but what is next now? All right, yeah, thank you. Um, so I'll ask uh, Christian to come back on the line as we wrap up before we head into Q&A. Just have a few concluding words um, that we wanted to get out. So do you see a ton of great questions coming in? I know Nick was on the line monitoring that and we'll get to them shortly. But I really want to thank Christian Nicholas today for sharing their knowledge and tools. Um, that was really interesting chat GPT demo. And also remind you that at DocuWare, we're dedicated to hosting educational sessions like these to ensure professionals like you can stay ahead of the curve and have the latest information, strategies, tools to excel in your field. And as a leader in document management and workflow automation, DocuWare is transforming the way finance and accounting professionals manage their processes by enabling increased efficiency, streamline operations, and enhance compliance and security. So we encourage you to explore the benefits that the DocuWare solution can bring to your organization. Simply head to DocuWare.com or reach out to your DocuWare partner. You can reply to the webinar invitation you received. And just as a reminder, uh, we have another session with Christian Nicholas on March 19th. It's titled, How to Thrive in a Future Free of Manual Finance Processes. So this event will give you additional know-how, how to succeed in an automated future that actually allows you time to focus on the strategic tasks that we were discussed before, such as business partnering, early trend spotting, and financial storytelling. So you'll be emailed a link to register for the session, so definitely keep an eye out for that. And with that now, we will open it up for Q&A. So, hey Nick, welcome back. Hey guys, great call as always. Right. Um, I have a few questions coming in ready for the Q&A. So the first one is from Andreas. Um, and this one is uh, for Nicholas because it is regarding ChatGPT. So Andreas has said, how do you handle privacy? AI models are supplied by third party providers. How do you assure that information supplied to AI is not misused? Okay, really good question. So if you are using third party and you are you, your company didn't sign a contract to have uh, the, the information protected imagine that using ai is like using your private gmail account i'm sure your company doesn't allow you to send over every month your financial figures your company doesn't allow you to discuss with your neighbor about uh, the next project that is strategical so Talking with AI about all of this is also not allowed by our contract. Uh, but it doesn't prevent you to talk with your neighbor about maybe how SAP is working. It doesn't prevent you to talk with somebody who is working for a competitor about good practices and to learn from the others. It doesn't prevent you to go on Google and search about uh, how do I improve my inventory. And when you think like this, actually, you can use ChatGPT much more. And 99% of the use case that I show is actually uh, usable without giving any confidential information. And let me show you like, just something quickly. Like, Let's imagine now that uh, what I just shared, uh, let me show Excel. So this Excel file. Well. This Excel file. Let's imagine that I want to do this analysis on this Excel file. I can anonymize the first lines. So imagine I have Mickey Mouse and Mini. I will just copy this because uh, actually I don't have Mickey Mouse in my company. And I can go back to ChatGPT. And here, even with the model 3.5, I can just say I have this data um, and i can say that it's an example here is an example of two first lines and i can ask what kind of analysis can i do based only on this 
data. And you will see that the answer that we had before are exactly the same because ChatGPT recognize there is a name column, there is a department column, position, salary column, increase column. And once I have this, I can ask for the salary distribution analysis, how do I do the salary distribution analysis in my Excel file, including visualization? And now you get all of the formula you need to use, and you can even see to, that you can create a box plot. You have exactly the instructions. So now I go back to my Excel file, and I do what ChatGPT told me. So select this column, select this column, insert, go to here, and you have the same graph. And ChatGPT doesn't know anything about the data because everything I gave was just fake. But now on my own data, and let's imagine I remove the fake lines, I have my graph. And that's how you deal without giving any confidentiality information. You still get the full value of AI helping you doing your work better. All right. Thank you so much. Um, next question. It sounds sounds like it could be for um, both you, Christian, Nicholas. How does the panel see the role of generative AI in determining financial forecasts for organizations? I mean, I can I can get started. I'm also curious to hear what Nicholas thinks. But <clears throat> I think um, today, you know, we are not at a point yet where. People can just type in ChatGPT, hey, what will my sales be uh, next quarter? And then just take that and then submit that to, to, to the board, right? Uh, we're definitely, you know, further away from that. But we are on a journey of getting closer to that point where something like forecasting, et cetera, becomes much, much easier. Now, the important thing is that what, essentially what that means is related to what I said earlier, you'll have much more time on your hands to do higher value activities. So now is the time I would argue to think about, okay, what are those higher value activities? How can I be a better business partner? How can I be better at presenting, at influencing, at getting people to take action on you know, what my, my, my analysis says? So I think that's really what finance teams should focus on is building that capability, building those skills around influencing, business partnering and deeper analysis. Yeah, to, to complement and be more technical, uh, if, if somebody was uh, wanting just the technical part, again, generative AI is not there to compute the forecasting because it's not this, the strength of the model. What the model can do, it can pick up an algorithm that is specialized on machine learning and forecasting, like something that was made by Facebook, Profit, and will tell you based on your data, you can use the model profit and the model looks like this so it gives you the code and how to use it and then you go back in your own environment you apply and it's only like two three lines of code of python you apply the model on your historical data and the model of machine learning and uh, profit uh, will give you the your sales based on the seasonality that you have and that's what you can do based on the existing model, but you can also build your own model and you can use generative AI to help you build it. But at the end, it will not be generative AI which will compute it. It will be another model from machine learning. We will recognize patterns and then apply those patterns to compute a forecast. Thanks guys. Uh, another question here, bit of an interesting one for you. Uh, Will generative AI replace finance jobs in the future? For okay, uh, I love this question. <laughs> so, for me, there will be three types of people. One, the people that ignore AI and will still work like before. And imagine 39 years ago when Excel arrived, there were still people like computing with their own calculator 
and I don't know how many people like this are still working. We are all uh, using Excel. So, and why? Because we are just making our work faster. We can make complex financial models, uh, build more scenarios just because we are using the technology. Um, so those people that ignore it, I don't think they have a future in finance because finance is really technology and figures and a lot of transactions oriented. So best place for te technology. But then there will be a second type of people, the people who use AI just as um, a messenger. So they will just go in AI and do copy and paste. So I go in ChatGPT, I ask a question and I copy and paste when somebody asks me the question. And this will also really soon be replaced by agents that can do that for you and that are also digital. So if you don't own anything and you don't take ownership and just do the copy and paste between AI and your uh, own work, you have a big risk, big risk of uh, making mistakes because you don't review it and big risk that you are not adding value. And then there will be the third type of people. And I think the 1000 people that are here, I hope you are going there, is people that are embracing, that are embracing AI, but knowing that you are the factor that will make AI work good or work bad. Because everything you put in the machine, either for machine lear learning the data quality, either for generative AI, your prompt and your knowledge of the context, and then the process of reviewing, of testing if what is coming out is good and worthful for your business, this is where you are going to be a valuable professional. And I'm sure everybody who's listening here with everything they learned already today, they are going in this direction. So no, it will not replace you if you choose the last type of individual. And I wish everybody is going on in this direction today. Great, um, another question, kind of switching towards um, the automating processing reporting. Uh, Christian, what are what would you say are the top three most important finance KPIs that workflow automation can improve? That's a great question because <clears throat> it really you you should look at improve helping improve all of the KPIs uh, generating those KPIs because the thing is when you many many finance teams are stuck in you know the month and close takes one or close to two weeks of the month you know until they finally have the actuals reconciled they understand them they did the variance analysis they updated the management reporting deck and that only leaves two weeks for deeper analysis for t walking over to your marketing business partner and asking about hey you know i see you changed tactics you know why is that um and then updating the forecast and and you do it again in the next month and through workflow automation, you free up time to do you know, all these things that help move the needle. And then you can move the needle across all KPIs, across you know, how can we grow more sustainably? How can we cut costs without impacting the top line? Um, so the, rather than looking at, okay, what's the metric I can impact? I would focus on building a consistent process of workflow automation, you know, where you every month you think about how can I remove an Excel formula or add a formula here instead of doing a copy paste or maybe do a macro or use ChatGPT more, of course. And that then those small actions will, will give you a lot of benefit over time. Thanks, guys. Uh, another question, probably more for Nicholas. Uh, having seen the demo of salary analysis, can J Chat GPT actually provide insight from this analysis? Yes. So, what it can do, for example, we have 1,000 lines. What it can tell me, it can tell me which department uh, have the highest salaries. It can tell me the outliers. So maybe uh, there are 10 people that are earning 10 times more than all of the rest. It can also tell me if between all of the departments, some departments get more increase and others not. What it cannot tell me, because I didn't give this context, it cannot tell me if a department is more productive because it doesn't have this information. It cannot tell me why 
a department get a better increase or not because maybe it's a management decision and it doesn't have the email that says that so it will only do i will say big data science work where us with our eyes and without doing excel magic we will not see uh, some outliers we will not see some trends well chatgpt can do that much faster using uh, data science and if you want more insights linked with context then you need to provide context and if you provide a second page with um, the performance of each department then it, it might link oh the salary increase is linked with the performance it might see this trend but one thing i want to advise everybody again don't put any confidential information inside and also if you have two huge files let's imagine you have 50,000 employees and you have uh, 50,000 lines of productivity so gpt has no processing power to take care of this and it will just start with the first 100 lines and will stop so it will not do the work like it, you will do in excel so instead of doing that just use my method and ask the methodology to apply in your own environment and then you can do it with confidential information because you are in your own environment and you can scale it and you can also automate it because imagine you have the question every month then you don't need to go back and chat gpt you have done the work once and then you just update with new figures all right yeah looks like um we have another question here i believe christian um kind of sh shifting gears someone is asking how closely will finance teams collaborate with it and technology teams during implementing new technology yeah that, <clears throat> that's a great question and I'm, I'm happy that you're bringing this topic up because that really depends so historically you know even five years ago five six seven years ago when you implemented a new software you needed to have an IT team and you needed to work you know, closely with that IT team because implementing software is, was, was cumbersome and you know, takes a lot of technical expertise to, to get right. But it has changed, especially in the last, I would say, yeah, five, five to seven years where we have much more uh, software as a service companies, you know, cloud-based software where they um, build the software so that finance teams can do it without having to work with uh, IT teams. And that means that, you know, you get on a call with someone from, from the vendor, maybe even once a week, and they help you with the setup, they explain you how the software works, they train you, and they basically take your hand and walk you through. And what that has done is that even small companies, you know, who don't have, maybe have one IT person, uh, can do can implement planning tools or automation tools or workflow uh, automation tools. So I think this is where where it's going, that these IT teams won't be needed to do software implementation. And instead, you know, like finance teams, they can also do more higher value tasks like IT strategy, you know, vendor selection and those more longer term, longer term work. Would you say it's maybe yeah, not so much just very um, back and forth, but more just like guidance? They could still guide in um, exactly. Helping. Okay, exactly. Great. Rather than spending hours and you know making sure that everything ticks and ties, they can provide guidance and help the other teams with you know getting the software up and running. Exactly. Should we do one more? Uh, yeah. This one is probably for both both of you guys actually, Christian and Nicholas. Um, how do we use ChatGPT for invoice processing and payment receivables processing? Uh, good question. So ChatGPT itself will not help you a lot because it's not connected to your systems. And with a process like invoice processing, which is high volume, you want that you no human touch it because uh, if for every invoice and you can have companies that have 10,000 invoices per per month you don't want that for every invoice a human is there what you can do instead is you can go and use a OCR tool there are plenty of OCR tool which recognize the invoice so 
basically the process should start with you get the invoice either paper or pdf then you make sure you have it digitally then the ocr process recognize all of the invoice and we'll see all of the fields and then you will have a tool like gpt which is uh, the model behind ChatGPT. we'll recognize the field and we see oh if i see an invoice number then at a really, really high percentage i can map it in the erp to the invoice number field and then by doing this you will have the input of the invoice directly done by the system and only you as human you will only go for exceptions when uh, the tool like gpt and ocr are not sure about where um, to process this invoice and so this is high level after you have some uh, connection with your purchasing team and with if you can authorize the booking of the invoice or not but basically the technology is uh, two technology ocr which recognizes an image and make it characters so change the image to characters and second once you have this character how you can map it to your system by using the nlp of gpt which knows that if he sees invoice number he goes to the rp and map it to invoice number yeah that's and a great example that, yeah now i wanted to say once you have that you can process 10,000 of invoice uh, really quickly rather than having 10 people processing all of these 10,000 invoice yeah i think it's a fantastic example to finish on because it shows the how chat gpt will be used in the future in that it's not just used to copy pasting text but it works hand in hand with other pieces of software and then the total of all of it is able to do much more than each individual piece of software uh, alone so yeah i think that's a great vision into the into the future of finance all right great thank you so much everyone um th that's all about all the time we have for today uh, for any questions we didn't answer definitely bring them to that march 19th session you will receive an invitation for that and christian if you just don't mind popping up our just last slide here just to thank everyone again for joining us today it was great we had over a thousand professionals from around the world uh, look out for an email by tomorrow with the recording the slides and the handout um, and please complete the short survey that will pop up once the webinar ends. We really appreciate your feedback. We will contact the first 100 attendees on the Amazon, Amazon e-gift card giveaway within 30 days. So, so thank you so much again to everybody. We hope everyone has a great day and we'll see you all on March 19th. Take care. <laughs>